All right, so in follow-up to our last video where we talked about this case where this young lady had had a POTS diagnosis for two years, and we were able to do some kind of unique diagnostic testing and determine that she had a change in cerebral blood flow, blood flow to her brain, that allowed us to be able to figure out a different treatment solution so that we could solve the problem. And she actually recovered within a month of doing that type of neural rehab. So the question then becomes, like, what, do you, what did you do? Like, what is the actual nuts and bolts of how to did you make it from symptoms for this long to um, feeling better in a month? And that's a reasonable question. Um, it's kind of like a little bit hazardous to answer because these are complex cases. They're obviously complex or it wouldn't take two years to solve them. Um, and the tendency would be to take what I'm about to say and turn that into a template to apply to everyone that has POTS or this certain types of symptoms. And my hope is that we don't do that. What I'm trying to maybe convey here is that through a, a nuanced way of thinking, we're able to give a different perspective on how to solve these types of problems. So um, rather than giving you a template or giving you a recipe for how to do it, what I want to talk about is the thought process that we can go through to figure these types of cases out. And I think that's useful both to patients and practitioners to kind of see how do you move through the logic to be able to come to that type of a conclusion or that type of a solution. So that's what I want to talk about today. So um, if we start from the fact that we take that little bit of knowledge that we have to start with is that through the left side of the middle cerebral artery using transcranial Doppler ultrasound, we were able to measure that when she moved from laying down at zero degrees, and then we move her up to 70 degrees of tilt. It kind of mimics standing, but it's standing without the benefit of having the ability to move or create a muscle pump through your legs, things that would normally create assistance for returning blood to the heart and then giving blood flow to the brain. We want to look at taking all of those variables out. How well does the brain do at controlling the cerebral, or excuse me, the cardiovascular system to be able to keep blood flowing to the brain without having to rely on other strategies. And when we look at cases that have orthostatic intolerance, they don't tolerate standing up, POTS being kind of chief among them, these are the things we see is that when they stand up, we see the tachycardia because it's an adaptation to try to solve for the fact that we're not getting blood flow to the head. So interesting part about this case, when we do that, when we do zero to 70, right? laying down to standing up, and we see a drop of blood flow that is more on the left side than on the right side, that is helpful. Number one, because it means that when she's laying down, she feels relatively fine, which would suggest that if cerebral blood flow is the culprit, then cerebral blood flow when she's laying down is fine, but when she stands up, that's when things fail, and then she experiences symptoms from that. So that's kind of the assumption that we go on, but we have to prove that backwards. So the way that we think about that is if someone is at zero and then 70 and we can measure that change, we're measuring a change in the blood flow velocity coming through, like we said, the middle cerebral artery. And to break that down a little bit further, the middle cerebral artery is an extension of the carotid arteries. We have one on either side of our neck and they take blood pumped from the heart and then help us pump into the brain. So the posterior cerebral artery, and then we have the middle cerebral artery, which is kind of like a continuation. It continues going straight up. And we can measure that really well through this temporal window um, on the side of our head and our, kind of on our temporal bone. And we can measure the speed of the blood flow through that vessel, and we can look at how that speed changes in different scenarios. So that's really what we're measuring. But when we look at that, we can think about it a little bit deeper and say, if we're losing blood supply, or we're getting ischemic on that side of the brain and we're getting symptoms associated with that, are there other things, other functions that are associated with that territory that we might be able to use as proxies to make sure that we're measuring, or excuse me, that when we measure that decrease in blood flow, we're actually measuring the thing that's causing a lot of the symptoms. So we can correlate. When we think about what we can do laying down versus sitting up, there were two things in this case that kind of stood out. Number one was that when she was seated, when we would do ocular or visual pursuit testing, 
This is where we have someone follow a target. Usually the simple thing to do is say, look at my thumb. And we have them follow a target in different directions, right? We should be able to see that their eyes stay locked on that target wherever it goes. Like, uh, like a cat watching the canary in the bird cage, right? So you see their eyes track exactly where, they're, where the target goes. And they should be able to do that smoothly in horizontal position, in vertical, and in both diagonals. We found in this case, she wasn't able to do that. She had these really jumpy pursuits where, where it's almost like her eyes couldn't keep up with the target. So they'd go, the target would move, and they'd have to catch up. The target would move, they'd have to catch up again. Okay, so we call these catch-up saccades that are errors in pursuits. If we think about that a little bit deeper, we'd say, well, where does that pursuit pathway come from? Where is it happening in the brain? So one of the key areas is we have these parietal visual areas. So like we have the parietal eye field, we have a frontal eye field, and they're responsible for picking up different portions of our environment and how our eyes are going to interact with them. So in the parietal eye field, which kind of happen up and back here, this is where we take in information about our visual stream. And in order to follow a target, that parietal eye field has to be intact and then it projects its pathways forward to actually make the eyes move. So it's almost like the parietal eye field has to be intact to be able to see the picture coming through the camera so that we can then move our eyes around to stay on it, okay? Now, if we take, that, take her and then move her down into a supine position, we actually see that those eye movements get smoother. So there's a difference between being supine, laying down, versus being upright and even seated in this, in this condition, okay? So that's number one. So what we can take from that is, all right, when she sits up, that portion of the brain isn't getting the same amount of activity. That may possibly be relative to the blood flow, okay? So number two thing that we noticed was that we do sensory testing. So we may take um, pinwheel, which is these little sharp, um, uh, like needle-like projections on it. And we can rub that on your skin and it feels, it feels sharp. It feels uh, prickly. And then we can all, that, type, that tests one type of small sensory fiber. And then we can look at vibration. We can look at light touch. And we can see if the sensory nerve from the body is able to project and land where it's supposed to in the brain, right? So for her, when we lay her down and we measure all of the different modalities on the sensory system, in her face, in her arms, in her trunk, in her legs, everything is symmetrical. It's the same on both sides. Then when she sits up, and especially when she stands up, we start to notice that she gets less sensation on the right side of her body. So we see these little patches where she doesn't feel it. The pinwheel doesn't, it feels smooth. The vibration doesn't feel as intense as it does on the other side. And we know that the right side of the body, its nerves travel up, cross over into the left side of the brain, into the somatosensory cortex, which is also kind of up here in this parietal area, the primary parietal strip, okay? Primary sensory strip. So from that information, we can start to look at it and say, we're seeing these changes, not just in the blood flow itself, but also in the function of these systems. So when she lays down, they operate okay, but when she stands up, they don't operate as well, they don't function as well. So they become these neurological proxies or these functional proxies to what we're seeing with blood flow. And this is really useful. So we, okay, so we take that question and we say, how do we use that function? Or is there a way that we can transition her from being able to lay down, doing okay, but to be able to transition to standing up and still be okay to sustain, sustain that blood flow? That's the question. So there are a couple things that we think about with that. Number one comes back to the idea of the pursuit. So if we look at going a little bit deeper, and I think it's valuable, so stay with me, but there's a really great book, um, The Neurology of Eye Movements. It was published by Lee and Z, several editions now. Easy reading. Um, but in that book, what we learn about is there's a little bit more nuance to how these pursuits work and the way they operate and what makes them accurate. And it's this idea of 
retinal slip. So what that means is if you can imagine looking through binoculars, like you're watching, maybe you're watching a bird, maybe you're watching, you're looking at a deer, maybe you're watching a football game or a soccer match, whatever. Pick the thing that you like to watch. But if you're looking through the binoculars, we've got like these two tubes. And if you're following something that's moving through that tube, our eye can sense when we're getting toward the edge of that binocular and we have to adjust the binocular to be able to stay on the target. If whatever we're looking at, if that deer is able to run faster than we can keep up with, we have to jerk and try to find that target again. And this mimics what we see with those catch up pursuits where the fovea or the ability to detect the slip on the retina is going to help us determine how accurate the eye is going to be in tracking the target. So a pursuit has to have accurate retinal slip to be able to maintain the target. What's interesting about that is there's another system that also has to use a retinal slip to be able to detect its accuracy. So just like we can follow something like this, if I look at you, if I look into the camera and I turn my head, I also have this vestibularly based mechanism. It's called a vestibulo-ocular reflex. It's a little bit different in the sense that this one is a reflex, whereas a pursuit is something you have to do on purpose. You have to do volitionally. But this reflex is kind of like the foundation of what later becomes a pursuit. And the ability to be able to accurately turn your head and keep your eyes on a target relies on not slipping again. So the detection of a retinal slip in a vestibulo ocular movement helps us to be able to keep our eyes locked on a target. Similarly, we have this transition when we look at a pursuit where that retinal slip helps us keep on a target in the visual field that's moving. And as your brain develops, you have the ability to do both. You can move your head and body and walk in space and also be able to track something that's moving. So this retinal slip idea is really central to our ability to navigate around in the world to be able to have a moving body that can tolerate a moving world. Okay. So from a rehab perspective, what we want to think about is can we train that visual pursuit or that retinal slip mechanism so that we can translate it back to a standing posture. So when we do a VOR or a, visit or a head thrust, we are activating that retinal slip mechanism, which is going to have a parietal distribution of activity, meaning when we move our head and we control that with our eyes and we pursue, or excuse me, and we have the VOR, we get activation within that hemisphere of our brain. So specifically, if we do movements that are to the right, they are going to be more directed toward pursuits that happen on the right side, or excuse me, on the left side. Um, so if we're thinking about increasing blood flow to the left side, what kinds of things would cause increases of blood flow into the brain? The one and only is neural activity. So when we have neuron metabolism, that is what drives blood flow to the brain. So if we increase the neural metabolism from cells in that territory of the brain, we have to increase blood flow velocity in order to meet that metabolic need. And it's a really big concept. So if we pair those things together and say, can I do exercises that activate that retinal slip mechanism? So I get that parietal firing through both the vestibular system, through my eyes moving, through my neck moving. These things all fire into this parietal area. Then I'm going to increase blood flow into that area. Okay, so that's the thought behind that activity. So we say, okay, if we know that, that may be a mechanism that we can use to help reestablish the pursuit, to use the VOR to reestablish the retinal slip and transfer that into a more accurate pursuit. And from what we know from studies through Lee and Z, um, that is the case. That's how we can do that. We can actually use VOR as a mechanism to retrain and pursue. Very cool stuff. And we have the benefit of being able to direct it toward the area of the brain that we're interested in sending more blood flow to. Cool. So in this case, what we're going to do is do we want, so the next question you have to think about is, do you want to sit them up like I'm sitting right now? 
and practice that exercise going to the right? Well, maybe not, because in that position, we already know that there's a decreased blood flow, that we already have a failing adaptation in that seated position. So if I want to exercise those cells, if I want to make them work harder, putting them in a reduced blood flow scenario is probably not going to be their most advantageous position to start from. So I want to think about positioning. If I want to work those cells, I want to give them the best probability of getting blood flow so that I can work them and make them healthy again. Remember, these are not healthy cells. These are sick cells. So if they're sick, then we have to be able to treat them um, a little more gently than if they were strong and robust and really active. So in this case, what we'll do is we actually lay her back down on her back where we know that blood flow is more stable, more reliable. And then we do the exercise while she is laying down. That allows us to be able to stimulate that mechanism so that she's able to have that accurate pursuit. Then we wanna be able to transfer it. So we make sure it's working, we exercise that system. And then anything you know about exercise is that you have to make it progressively harder to add a bigger challenge to make that neuron grow, to, to allow that neuron to be able to take on more activation, to be able to create more synaptogenesis, to be able to work at a greater context than just being able to lay down and you know watch the birds fly by. Okay, so that's kind of like that's that portion of the strategy. So we're, we've realized like we want to change blood flow. We know we've got this visual pursuit system that fails when she's upright, and we know we've got um, a sensory system that starts to fail when she's upright. One of the things we don't pay attention to thinking about a tilt test is we go from zero to seventy degrees. Right, so we're measuring to full upright, what is the difference? What's the delta in that position? The thing we don't do is we don't measure at what, what is the inflection point where someone starts to fail? Is it at 70 degrees? Maybe they start to fail at 60 degrees, 50 degrees, 40 degrees. Where's the point? So that's the next thing that we wanna measure is we measure what is the point of what we call uh, decomposition? Meaning, where does the adaptability to be able to tolerate orthostasis start to decompose? The way that we do that is we take the same tilt test, but we break it down. And we move someone in five degree increments. So start at zero, five, 10, 15, 20, 20, you know the drill. And as we move up, we're looking at the same markers and we're looking at that blood flow to see what is the point at which we see a spike where the blood flow drops significantly at a certain moment. So when we do that, we come up through and we can see what is the inflection point where the blood flow actually starts to drop down. Is it at five degrees? Is it right away? Or is it at 45 degrees? Is it 50 degrees? Whatever the thing is. So we do that not only to get a baseline, but we do that individually throughout each session that we treat someone with because it may change and fluctuate based on their tolerance level at that given moment. So it can change based on uh, how much they've slept. It can change based on how hard we've worked. It can change based on if they've just eaten or not. So there are a lot of different variables. So each session we will find that point, 30 degrees, that's where it fails this time. And then we will take them just below that to where they can recover, right? So the, it starts to fail at 30. If we bring them down to 25, and we see that system's able to tolerate 25. Perfect. So now we've created this, this tension where we can do the exercise, we can challenge the system, and we can challenge the orthostasis at the same time. We can challenge the tilt level. And by doing that, we're forcing that system have to recognize that blood flow at a little bit tighter constraint. And we're forcing it to be able to pair those or to couple those two things together. So I can tolerate, I have to be able to control my, my vascular system better. I have to be able to control my cardiac system better. And also at the same time, dual task, these things that I'm doing within my brain. And what we can see is that if, if we're at that tilt level at that 25 degrees, and they're able to do the exercise, but then it starts to fail and break down, we, can, we know we have to take a break because we're not able to feed that area the same way. And we can use that to really 
hone in on measuring right on that edge of where we need to work. And we'll do that over time. From session to session as we're going, we measure that. We're looking to see if we can increase the tilt angle while still maintaining the quality of the exercise that we're doing. And if we can maintain that quality, we're, we're rebuilding the foundations of the system so that we're not creating all these poor adaptations along the way. We're saying this is fundamental to the activity. We have to be able to do these tasks and we have to be able to do them not just laying down, but also sitting up. So in this case, we do, we, we actually measure them, measure the pursuit along with the sensory system. So we have kind of two markers that we know are gonna track together. So we will look and make sure that blood flow looks good, pursuit looks good, sensory at stimulation looks good, right? Sensory perception looks good. And as long as those look good, we will keep running that exercise and then trying to progress them up through the levels. What we also added in in this case, not like you need more nuance and maybe it's getting boring by now, but this is what people wanted to know. So then we would think about, are there other things that we can do to add to this system? So can we further add another layer of challenge? So you might think about this, um, like if you were, if you were learning to play a musical instrument, like at first you're just learning, like if you're, you're playing the recorder, my son is in third grade. He's learning how to play a recorder. Super fun time at our house right now. Anyway, so if you're learning how to play the recorder, first thing is to figure out like, how do you blow in it? And then where do you put your fingers? And then can you also do both of those things and then move your fingers around to make the sounds that you want to make? So you add these layers of complexity. So in this case, we know one of the soft spots in the system is that we lose that sensory distribution on that side. Um, so what we chose to do in this particular case was also use peripheral nerve stimulation. So using an electrical nerve stimulator, we would look at which areas became patchy and stimulate the peripheral nerve associated with that area. And in doing so, we're increasing the sensory barrage to that portion of the parietal lobe, All right? So if I stimulate my median nerve, for example, Right, the median nerve kind of comes up through here and, and innervates this portion of the hand. If I stimulate that portion, it's going to go to the hand part of that parietal lobe on this side. And if I stimulate those neurons, they are going to request more blood flow into that area. Okay, so you can see where we're going here. Now, the caveat is we can't just arbitrarily, blankly stimulate these nerves and send blood flow to the area. We have to do it within a constraint. And the constraint we're looking at is we don't want to stimulate a nerve that is already not sending appropriate sensory information. So if I send a nerve that's numb and then I juice it and give it more input, I'm already exceeding the capacity of the brain to feel that area, even just sitting ambiently. So if I add more to it, all I'm doing is pouring salt in the wound and increasing a stimulus to an area that already can't be felt. So the caveat is that when we're in that position, we're doing the VOR exercise, and we want to add the peripheral stimulation, we have to make sure that that sensory system is already operating effectively before we put weight on the bar, before we add to the stimulation. And that's super important. We do that every time. So you check it every time as we're coming through. So those simple things like using the VOR to translate into pursuit, using tilt angle, looking for the inflection point of when we actually start to lose the cerebral blood flow, and then looking at peripheral nerve stimulation is the mechanism that we used to consistently bring up that elevation so that we could elevate her in space without losing sensory perception, without losing the visual pursuit, and without losing cerebral blood flow, we start to see that's when you see sleep get better, symptoms start to go away, and on and on you go. So where we actually see the objective measures that we're taking as we're walking through the treatment are translating into a better symptomatic experience. And then from there, our job is to keep adding in layers of challenge that approximate the things she's trying to do in her life. So these would be things like adding exertion, adding mental tasking, prolonging the endurance so she can do it for 
you know, 10 minutes and then 20 minutes and then 30 minutes and then an hour and then two hours in the full day, you see the, you see the strategy here. So, and in each segment, we're making sure that we are pushing it, we're challenging that system, but we're not overdoing it to where we're creating uh, a deficit or causing an injury. So I realize that went a little long, um, just kind of off the top of my head, I wanted to explain the process of what we're going through there. But I'm hoping what you can see is how we're taking uh, a little different nuanced approach to diagnostics in orthostatic intolerance, and then how we take that and it translates specifically, we, we hold that still as we're moving through treatment. So we will, we will stimulate an area and then check to make sure it works and then stimulate it, stimulate it, make sure it works. And when it fails or fatigues, we go away and take a break, let the brain recover and come back the same way you would bench press, bench press, bench press until you fail and then go away, sleep, eat, do all the things, come back next week, try to do it a little bit heavier. The benefit of working with brains is that the half-life of that response is much quicker. So we can get them back quicker and get them under tension quicker and get them moving faster. So um, anyway, give me some feedback. Let me know if this is something that you're interested in having me talk about. It's a little more lengthy and maybe takes a little more effort to understand, but maybe I can dial into what is the best mechanism to be able to share how we're doing these things with you guys. So please leave a comment, send me a message, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank you.